Martha, Martha is the Associate Director at the University of Delaware Water Resources Center, our unit, uh, in the Institute of Public Administration and the Biden School of Public Policy and Administration. She's worked at Water Resource Center for 18 years. She also worked on projects to increase public knowledge about water resources and provide scientific and technical data to decision makers in Delaware and the region. She is a graduate of Lehigh University with a BS Biology and University of Delaware with a, I guess, Master's in Public Administration. And also, most important, she's a member of our board. So I'll now hand it over to Martha and, and thank you, Martha. Thanks very much, Dennis. Um, thank you everyone for joining the WRA DRB Climate Change and Resilience webinar. Um, we know you're given so many invitations and opportunities to um, join webinars. So we really appreciate um, your attendance and hope um, we can provide you with a worthwhile conversation on climate change and resiliency today. Um, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Oleg Kostin. Oleg has worked as a water industry professional since 1985, serving in various roles for the Passaic Valley Water Commission, Elizabethtown Water Company, and New Jersey American Water. Oleg joined New Jersey American Water in November of 1987 and is currently the Director of Operations. In this role, Oleg ensures production, operations, alignment, and regulatory compliance statewide through operator training, establishing standard operating procedures, sharing best practices, and implementing quality assurance programs. He identifies and implements efficiency improvement projects and is a company resource for treatment processes, techniques, and contributes to water production, capital project planning, design, and delivery. Um, today, Oleg will talk about uh, the innovation and unified action in response to climate change challenges that threaten drinking water for many in New Jersey. Um, so today, Oleg will talk for, um, I guess, about 40 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for um, Q&A. Um, you can also put your questions in the chat, and Skelly and I will be monitoring the chat. So take it away. Okay, thank you, Martha. Okay, so today what we're gonna talk about is the, uh, uh, is the uh, flood protection that we erected around the Raritan Millstone Water Treatment Plant. Uh, the Raritan, uh, Raritan Millstone Water Treatment Plant, as I said, is located in Bridgewater Township uh, uh, in Somerset County, New Jersey. And it's a, it's a regional water supplier it supplies water to over a million people in the uh, in the uh, central New Jersey section of uh, in, in central New Jersey, which covers Somerset, Hunterdon, Mer uh, Mercer, Union, Morris, Passaic, Middlesex, and Essex counties. Uh, we are considered a tier one asset uh, in the Department of Homeland Security, which means that uh, anything that happens to us has a regional impact on uh, health and, and the economy. So we're on the radar of the federal government as well as the state of New Jersey. Uh, we have other systems that we serve aside from our own customers, uh, Franklin Township, uh, Edison, Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh, which we call uh, our Liberty System, uh, Middlesex Water and uh, South Brunswick are, are some of the uh, municipalities that we serve or, or entities that we serve other than our own customers. Uh, we have critical uh, interconnections with the city of Newark, uh, Sake Valley Water Commission, and the city of Trenton. Also, uh, you know, we've we've over 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 the years, over the past twenty or so years, we've sent water uh, as far north as as uh, Essex County uh, uh, it, during drought situations. So there's a lot of uh, of resiliency or planning around this particular facility. Uh, this facility itself produces roughly about 35 billion gallons of water a year. We average roughly 95 million gallons a day. Uh, we'll peak at, uh, you know, at, at over 180 million if necessary. Uh, that's pretty much everything in service and, and flowing at maximum capacity. Uh, we are also, uh, as I said, strategic in the fact that there are no other existing alternative water supply options for anybody. We are everybody's plan B. Uh, and so because of that, you know, this is a very important facility. So back in 1999, uh, we, we, uh, we experienced Hurricane Floyd uh, 
in, you know, at the Rip Millstone plant, we received roughly 13 inches of rain in 18, uh, in eight hours. Uh, and after the, the storm passed, we thought the worst of it was over, but there was a delayed response. And that delayed response was, uh, water coming in, uh, coming downstream from the watershed and, uh, you know, slowly, but surely, uh, inexorably, uh, entering the plant and, and flooding it to the point where it had to be shut down. It was a, um, it was a systematic shutdown. We took the, uh, the approach that it's better to de-energize the equipment than have it shorted out, uh, through, you know, in contact with water. So we did it. Uh, we had a plan to do it. Uh, we didn't want to have to execute it because it had never been done before. Uh, but we did. And, uh, you know, when, when that happened, we had a sister plant that we had, uh, that had come online in 1996, just three years prior, uh, as part of our, uh, expansion, you know, the, you know, the, and resiliency, even back then we knew that, uh, any future, uh, uh, water use or water requirements were not going to be able to be uh, be taken on by the rare millstone plant. So we constructed a facility directly across the river and uphill, most importantly, from the rare millstone plant. Uh, and you know, when the rare millstone plant uh, went down, uh, we ramped up at the at the canal road plant and were able to keep the system pressure pressurized, but uh, we were under low pressure conditions. So what happened once we shut the plant down, you know, aside from the fact that the plant was inundated by floodwaters and we had to uh, basically sit and wait to be rescued, we were flown out by helicopter. Uh, what we experienced around our system was low system pressure. Uh, you know, when you have low system pressure, you comprise, uh, you compromise a, a fire protection. Uh, because we couldn't maintain our normal system pressure, we also had to issue a boil water notice. Uh, so essentially what that means is you inform the public that there's a process breakdown and the water may not be uh, bacteriologically safe to drink. So, you know, the best uh, disinfection process is boiling the water. And so there's a process in place by New Jersey DEP and water purveyors in order to issue these boil water notices. And that went on for 10 days. Uh, businesses were closed, uh, schools were closed and uh, manufacturing was suspended in, in central Jersey for roughly a week uh, until we were able to get the system back up and operate it. Uh, these are some of the headlines in the papers while we were, uh, uh, you know, while we were down and uh, it was a very uh, challenging time. Uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, on top of trying to recover from the floods, we also had to deal with the public relations nightmare that that uh, that 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 arose from this particular event. So, you know, you know, it was not a pleasant experience. So, in the aftermath of Hurricane Floyd. Uh, you know, as I said, we had a sister plant that was directly across the river, but uphill from, from the rare millstone plant. It was designed as a 40 million gallon a day plant. Uh, and, you know, once the rare millstone plant got shut down, we were able to ramp that facility up to 75 million gallons a day, uh, rough, almost uh, twice its rated capacity at the time. So uh, in, you know, in rapid succession, you know, after, after Hurricane Floyd, you know, we, we undertook a couple of different uh, projects. Uh, we, you know, a, a, as, a, as a backup plan, we systematically increased the production capability at the, uh, at the Canal Road plant from 40 to 60 million gallons a day. That happened pretty quickly. Uh, by 2001, it was up and operating at 50% at, uh, higher capacity. And then in 2008, we went from 60 to 80. A million gallon rated capacity with a peak capacity of 100 million gallons a day. Uh, and that came online in 2008. The recovery of the rare millstone plant took roughly four days uh, to begin taking, uh, bringing unit processes back online. And, uh, you know, the first day, you know, 
after four days, that, that, that fifth day, we were able to bring 20 million gallon, uh, 20 million gallons of treatment capacity up into the you know, online and, and pumping out to the public. And each day uh, we increased another 20 million gallons. And we did that uh, until we got to what we call our, our average system delivery, uh, which means you know this is what, our, what we would average on a day to satisfy our own customer demand. Uh, and once we did that, uh, we, we backed off a little bit because people were working 24 hours a day uh, for, for roughly seven, seven to 10 days to get that capacity up and, and reliable. And so, uh, you know, before anybody got hurt, which uh, nobody did, which was a, a blessing that uh, everybody, even in those terrible conditions, were able to, uh, you know, work safely and there were no injuries associated uh, with any work that was occurring during the recovery process at the Rare Millstone plant after Hurricane Floyd. Uh, you know, it was a long drawn out process. Uh, you know, we, we got roughly in seven to 10 days, you know, the public didn't know uh, that uh, there was a problem with the treatment plant anymore because normal pressure was restored and uh, people were able to use water as they normally did. Uh, but in reality, the people who worked at the facilities, you know, were we're still dealing with, you know, the, the mess that was left behind. And roughly, it, it took probably two years until we actually got, you know, through all the damaged components, uh, you know, even 10 years after the fact, you would open up electrical cabinets, and you would find, uh, you know, mud that we didn't get to, uh, you know, dried mud inside electrical cabinets. Uh, the recovery process had to be done very slowly uh, because when we shut the plant down and we de-energized the facility, uh, what we did that so that we wouldn't cause shorts in the system. And, you know, once we got back into the plant after the flood, uh, you know, it was a very slow process of systematically going from the substation to each point, to each motor control center to make sure that uh, all the connections were clean and dry and you know, disconnecting motors from the pump assemblies, uh, sending them out to get baked and cleaned uh, and then coming back, reinstalling them and, and testing them electrically and, and then you know, move on to the next part of the process. Doing that took, as I said, roughly four or five days uh, and it had to be done very tediously or because if you energize you know, the system and you didn't do it correctly, you were going to cause a short. And if the short occurred, that was going to delay the ability to come back online. So there was a lot of uh, work that needed to be done beforehand before we could energize the systems back up, uh, back up online. As I said, we achieved uh, average day capacity within seven days, uh, I'm sorry, six days. Uh, the physical flood damage, when all said, uh, when all was said and done, was roughly 18 million dollars. That was 18 million dollars, and in 1999, 2,000 uh, dollars. It would be probably, uh, you know, double that in uh, uh, 2022 dollars, uh, especially with supply chain issues, you know, that we currently have. Uh, we immediately undertook the funding design permitting and construction of a uh, flood wall to protect the facility, uh, you know, you know, as soon as possible. Uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to construct a flood wall that put, would protect the facility uh, within a year. Uh, and we, you know, through working with the New Jersey DEP, the Army Corps of Engineers, we got permission to go to the 100 year flood elevation very quickly. Uh, the permitting was done in weeks, and the construction, uh, the, the design was done within a few months, and then the con construction took roughly, you know, four or five months to complete uh, in order to protect the, the, the front of the facility where the water came in. Uh, the flood wall elevation that we constructed to was elevation 44. Uh, that's, that's NGVD 29 uh, as the benchmark. Uh, we added the infrastructure in place 
to bring it up another two feet. Uh, the reason why we didn't go to elevation 46 from the get-go is because that would have delayed the construction process. We would have to gone through more environmental impact studies and things like that. So, uh, you know, we bit the bullet, went to the 100-year flood elevation, strengthened the wall so that we could raise it another foot or two feet if necessary. Uh, and, and then, you know, you know, always had in mind that we would go back and, and add more uh, height to the wall, you know, in the near future. Uh, the flood wall was completed before the peak of the 2000 hurricane season. Uh, and, uh, you know, as part of what we lived through, uh, we also developed, uh, you know, very detailed event plans and defined people's uh, responsibilities for any future uh, flooding events or potential flooding events. Here's a list of the 11 biggest storms uh, on record in, in Somerset County, specifically at this, at this uh, USGS gauge in Bound Brook. Uh, as you can see, 10 of the top 11 have happened within the past 20 years. Uh, and you know, it seems like uh, you know, the 500 year storm or the 100 year storm is happening every five years. And so you know, knowing this and seeing you know, the potential uh, you know, uh, for disaster, uh, we were always on edge with respect to uh, you know, what needed to be done next. So in August of 2011, uh, Hurricane Irene hit us. Uh, Hurricane Irene turned out to be the second storm of record. Hurricane Floyd was the storm of record. Uh, you can see the, these are uh, shots that I took from, uh, from one of our uh, elevated towers. And you can see that the facility is surrounded by water. The, the peak flow during that storm was roughly 754 million gallons a day rushing past uh, the Bound Brook gauge. And the peak, uh, the, the peak river crest elevation was 41.9 feet, uh, 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 NGVD 29. This photo here is what I call the money shot. Uh, it's the money shot is because, you know, when in the aftermath of the storm, when we showed the, uh, the executive leadership team just how close we came to disaster, what you're seeing there is the top of the flood wall. And we literally came within an inch away from being uh, inundated again. So that opened up a lot of people's uh, uh, eyes. And, uh, you know, we rapidly started planning for, for the next uh, uh, expansion of the flood protection. So the original flood wall withstood Hurricane Irene, but just barely. And the company, again, immediately undertook the funding design permitting construction to improve the flood wall protection around the facility. Uh, we went under wet, you know, several designs, and then, you know, you know, you have the Cadillac and you have the Volkswagen and anywhere in between. And so uh, we undertook a uh, cost benefit analysis and determined that uh, raising the flood wall to the 500 year flood elevation, uh, which is elevation 48, which is actually two feet higher than the plan that we had wanted to go to originally, uh, two feet above the 46 foot, you know, future expansion, uh, and decided that that was the most cost effective solution uh, for, you know, for the, for ourselves and for our customers. Uh, this was a, uh, was a five hole, five fold risk reduction from the original flood wall uh, elevation of 44. Uh, when somebody uh, says, a uh, hundred year flood or a 500 year flood, essentially what they're saying is, you know, you have a one, a one in a hundred chance of having something happen if it's a, a one in a hundred year flood. If you're a 500 year flood event, it's a 0.2% risk. Uh, and what that means is that each and every time that there's a, a storm event, that is the potential for, uh, for it re reaching those elevations. So the flood wall construction uh, was completed in time for the peak of the 2018 hurricane season. Uh, it was paid for through uh, the, you know, we, 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 we allowed ourselves or we went through the New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure, In Infrastructure Trust Fund, which is a low interest uh, funding source from the state. 
and uh, you know there is a portion that's forgiven, uh, you know. But uh, you know, the, ideally, from an investment standpoint, it's the it's the interest rate that uh, that that really helped us out. The final price uh, price tag for the flood wall was uh, just under thirty two and a half million dollars, and uh, from our standpoint, it was money well spent. So the the facility was or the new flood wall was designed by. Uh, URS, uh, who over, you know, during the design and construction process was, uh, was purchased or, or, or rolled into AECOM. Uh, we looked at the original uh, alternatives in 2014. The design, the design of the facility or the flood wall was uh, undertaken between 14 and 15. And the final design needed to be completed by June of 2015 to meet the uh, New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure, Infrastructure Trust funding timeline. So we had a condensed time in which to do all of this and meet the funding deadline for, for the Environmental Infrastructure Trust. The design included raising the existing flood wall elevation and extending flood protection to enclose the entire facility. Uh, you know, in when we did the original flood protection. It was, you know, primarily the front portion of the facility because that's where the lowest elevation was and that's the way the water made its way into the facility. So what we did uh, this time around is we expanded that flood protection to encircle the entire operating facility. And this was done uh, through a, a series of different types of flood protections. Uh, one, you know, we, you know, we use something called a combined diaphragm and combined L wall system, also known as combi walls, uh, in conjunction with uh, earthen berms and actually constructed uh, uh, flood walls. So what you're looking at here is the front of the facility. Uh, you can see uh, the flood wall uh, after it was, uh, it was poured. You can see the original flood wall elevation is the is this area here? It, it's it's color. It, it's got like a brick face associated with it, and this gray area here is the height that was added to the flood wall. So we we added roughly or exactly four feet on top of the old flood wall. Uh, we we installed new floodgates. Uh, these are press ray floodgates. The you know we've had really good experience with them in the past, so we decided to to spec the the floodgates. Uh, the press rate fl floodgates going forward also. Uh, what you're looking at here is, uh, is a combi wall. It's a combination of sheet pile uh, with uh, grout, grouting to, to keep uh, from undermining the, the, uh, the sheet wall with a concrete cap associated with it. And it, 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 it follows behind what we call a uh, our administration building here. Here's some more views. So this is a this is an L wall. It's a combi wall where you have a uh, uh, an earthen berm. There is sheet piling, and it's capped with a concrete, uh, you know, uh, flood flood cap. Uh, you can see both sides of it. So there's a, the, a left and a right side to it. Uh, you see another view of looking from the a drone view looking from the from what we call the low lift portion of the facility looking back to the front and then the earthen berm expansion is you know it, essentially an earthen berm is an earthen berm you just mound it up to uh, uh, to get to a specific flood elevation with specific materials that meet the standard for uh, in, uh, impervious surfaces uh, and you know this this outer edge over here is an earthen berm uh, and see again to the left side of the plant, almost the entire length of the west side of the plant is an earthen berm. Uh, you know, along comes uh, 2021 and Hurricane Ida. But prior to Hurricane Ida, there was Hurricane Henri. And the, you know, what, what, what happened here was, uh, it was a magnifying effect. So we had a, we had two storms within 10 days of each other. And we had a peak river elevation of 3,458, which was well below what, what we considered our old flood wall elevation. 
And then Hurricane Ida came, came by on September 1st and dropped 10 and a half inches of rain in roughly six hours. Uh, that river, river, that created a spike in river elevation to 4488. Had this flood wall not been constructed, you know, we would have been inundated again because our flood wall elevation was elevation 44. So roughly a foot of water would have come over the, uh, over the flood wall had this uh, construction not been done. So as I said, we got 10 and a half inches of rain in roughly six hours. This is measured at Somerville, which is the town that's right next to uh, Bridgewater. And the, and, and, the water, or, and the rain fell between 5.30 and 11.30 p.m. and then quickly exited. But it came down at such a, uh, you know, such a forceful rate that uh, you know, people couldn't even make it into the plant uh, you know, an hour into the storm. Uh, the, the roads were already starting to flood and people actually lost vehicles on their way into the plant. Uh, we were able to staff the facility uh, with enough people to, to keep the place going once the flood wall was closed, because once the flood wall is closed, you're in, you're in for the duration. And so you need to have a staffing plan in order to uh, you know, keep the place going while the storm is, uh, is, is raging around you. So as I said, 10 and a half inches of rain, and what that equates to, in a 12 hour storm is, you know, between a 500 year storm and a thousand year storm. So we got a lot of rain in a very short period of time. The results of Hurricane Ida. So, you know, the peak flow was rough, almost, uh, you know, you know, 83,000 cubic feet, uh, cubic feet per second, uh, which is a lot of water. <laughs> And the peak elevation down at the uh, at we call what we call the Calco Dam USGS station of forty two point one three. Luckily, these these peak elevations occurred during the daylight hours, uh, so you know people could actually see what was coming their way. Uh, you know, having something like this happen in the middle of the night, which is what happened during Hurricane Floyd, is is very scary because you can't see what's coming at you. So there was a little bit of break, uh, a little bit of luck there. The results of Hurricane Ida, Peak River Crest, 4488, as I mentioned previously, uh, at our and this was measured at our plant intake. Uh, we have a river gauge uh, there that that reads back to us continuously, and that is the uh, highest river elevation uh, reading that we had ever seen. Uh, had the flood wall not been uh, undertaken. Uh, the plant, again, as I said earlier, would have been inundated again. Uh, the financial impact would have been much greater than it was the first time around. And you ask, well, why would that be? And the reason is that with a flood wall, uh, flood protection around the facility, what, you wind up hap what winds up happening is uh, after the storm passes, the flood wall acts as a pond. And so now all the water that has infiltrated your facility is, is sitting inside your facility uh, as, as, a, as a lake. And you need to pump it out before you can, you know, before you can undertake any uh, recovery efforts. And so that would have delayed recovery uh, at least a, a few days until we got the water levels down inside the facility. Um, you know, one of the other things that we did uh, from Pat, because we learned from past experiences after we constructed the flood wall, we also embarked on a uh, emergency power upgrade at the facility. Uh, during Hurricane Irene, uh, there was a situation where uh, we, we, we have two high voltage lines that come into our facility, uh, 26 kV, 26, 26.4 kV lines coming into the facility, two separate lines, two separate feeders. Uh, you know, and, you know, one acts as a backup as to the others, a primary and the secondary line. Unfortunately, during Hurricane Irene, what happened was the primary line, uh, one, one of the poles on the primary side fell at a junction point onto our secondary feed, which knocked out both primary feeds into the facility, and we were forced to go on standby power. Now, fortunately, you know, we had 10 megawatts of standby power generation on site. The problem was that it's a gas turbine system and it is, it, 
essentially that gas turbine system is a Pratt Whitney jet engine from the 1960s, at which time, you know, things weren't very fuel efficient. And so we had 20,000 gallons of fuel on site and we had to go on emergency power immediately. And that gas turbine system was burning 500 gallons of fuel an hour. So we had a very limited, uh, or we had a somewhat limited supply of fuel on site and it was starting to get dicey there for a while. So because of that, you know, we decided to undertake uh, a standby power project where we went, we installed three uh, diesel power generators that were much more fuel efficient than the gas turbine that we currently have or that we originally had. And that, that extends our standby time to roughly uh, 96 hours, which is much longer than is necessary uh, in order to recover at least our experience from recovering from a, from a storm event. One of the other things that we learned is that, uh, you know, with this wonderful flood wall that we have protecting us, uh, keeping the water out, uh, the hydrostatic pressure from the river and the water around us pushes down and underneath and raises the groundwater level. And what that will do is, you know, if the, if the hydrostatic pressure is high enough, it could actually, you know, uh, uh, compromise concrete. And so uh, we undertook an uplift buoyancy study by AECOM to determine what areas within, within the flood protection uh, zone that were vulnerable to that kind of hydrostatic pressure. And so we undertook that study. This is a picture of our facility uh, surrounded by water in Hurricane Ida. And I'm going to call up uh, a video now a drone video so that you can see exactly what this place, what it looked like uh, with, with the facility up and running and protected uh, while the rest of the area suffered. So let me just cue that up. This is the front of the facility. The Raritan River, where that trestle is, is where the Raritan River is. And you can see that the facility is high and dry. Those three rectangular boxes that you see down there, that's the new standby power and the MCC associated with that. This is one of our sludge handling lagoons. River, river water is obviously the, uh, the chocolate milk looking stuff, water. That's the low lift pump station down below. And you can see how the, the surrounding area is completely flooded. So that in a nutshell is my presentation. Uh, if you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, I'll take those questions now. Did you also calculate the return period for the river flows elevation in addition to looking at the precip return periods? Uh, so uh, essentially, it's been our experience, you know, through all these storms that we've had that any, you know, floodwaters that, that uh, do materialize are, or dissipate rather quickly. So you'll see a very quick rise and, and, then, and then regression over time. Uh, so the longest period of time that we've, that we've seen, that we've experienced, uh, you know, where we have to you know, close the floodgates in anger is, is 24 to 36 hours where you know, you know, everybody's captured or is caught within the facility. And the, the floodwaters essentially go back down to, to, to normal river elevations. In this particular instance, it took about a week. Uh, you know, it got down to what we would consider uh, a relatively normal 
river flow. Normal river elevation is elevation 23. Uh, you know, there with 10 and a half inches of rain coming in through a 500 uh, square mile, I'm sorry, 900 square mile uh, watershed. Uh, you know, it took about uh, a week, maybe a week and a half to get back down to, you know, what we considered, you know, base flow elevations where the river is at elevation 23. Uh, we had, we were, you know, I had mentioned previously that uh, we were doing a, a study through uh, AECOM uh, regard, regarding uh, uplift, hydrostatic pressure due to floodwaters. And we were scheduled to, or we, we were gonna end the project actually in May of 2021. And I was able to convince uh, the, the project manager to continue the study through the end of the 2021 hurricane season, because it made no sense to end it at the beginning of a hurricane season. I wanted to extend it to the end of the hurricane season so that we could, you know, hopefully get a good storm and get another data point on there. Fortunately for us, or unfortunately for others, uh, you know, Hurricane Ida hit and we were able to get really good information with respect to how that water infiltrates or how it, how it impacts uh, groundwater levels and, you know, what kind of pressure it exerts on our structures. So, uh, you know, it, you know, hopefully this won't happen again for any long period of, uh, for, for a long period of time, but we now have good information regarding what we need to do in order to uh, fortify our facilities even further. And the next, the next question is what are the maintenance maintenance costs for the flood wall? So there's an ongoing, uh, on the earth and berm, portion of it, there's, uh, there's ongoing maintenance associated with, you know, you, you need to have vegetation on, you need to have grasses growing on the berm to keep it from eroding away, but you can't have saplings, you can't have rodents uh, burrowing into your, uh, into your flood, uh, into your earthen berms. So, uh, you know, annual, you know, we have regular landscape maintenance that, that is done on it. Uh, we, we patrol the area. Uh, monthly to make sure that there's no rodents burrowing into our flood protection. On an annual basis, we have uh, an engineer come by and walk the perimeter of the facility to, make, to, to check to make sure everything is, uh, is where it needs to be. And obviously, you know, if there's any visible uh, you know, deterioration or damage, uh, it's addressed immediately. Uh, it is concrete and steel. Uh, it is fairly new, so there's not a lot of maintenance associated at this point in time, but as time goes on, you know, it will be, it will be a required uh, element of maintaining that, uh, that flood wall. And, you know, we don't know, we may need to raise that flood wall again. There may be a time where we need to bring it up to the thousand, thousand year flood elevation. Uh, you know, that's yet to be determined. Uh, that is as uh, a, uh, a tactical decision that needs to be made at some time in the future, but you know, seeing what happened with Hurricane Ida, uh, we had we had uh, you know little less than four feet of freeboard uh, for until the water reached the top of the uh, our exist or our new flood wall elevation. So we hope that uh, that's going to be good for you know you know 10, 15, 20 years before we'd have to consider going up higher. Okay, the next question is, um, did you consider using any future climate projections as opposed to historical 500 year flood for the area when designing the flood walls? Well, we actually did. Uh, AECOM URS undertook a, you know, they, they took USGS flood inundation maps and they overlaid it into the flood zones. And essentially the reason why we decided to go with a 500 year flood elevation is because where this facility is located, uh, if at, at, a, at 750 or uh, 100 or 1000 year flood elevation, the entire area would be inundated. You know, I mean, it would, the, the, flood, the flood inundation would be massive. Uh, and, you know, the cost to benefit uh, was, was really not there for us to go beyond the 500 year flood elevation. We are a private water company. 
And uh, you know, because we're a private water company, uh, we do not get public funding for these projects. And our customers bear the cost of these capital investments. And so we need to be mindful of you know, cost benefit. Uh, we can't over design uh, because we, we feel like we want to. Uh, we need to be able to justify what we do. Uh, whenever we, we invest heavily, uh, we go through what's known as a rate case where we have to, when we, we, where we go back to our customers and ask for an increase in rates. And those rates are, 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 are looked at by uh, the Board of Public Utilities. They, they are the advocates for, for our customers. And we have to justify uh, every dollar that we spend. And so, you know, if they consider it prudent, a prudent investment, we'll get full recovery. If they don't consider it a, a, a prudent investment, they will not grant recovery. And so we need to make sure that everything that we do uh, can be justified. And so, you know, we have to show, we have to do all our due, due diligence and make our determinations based on those, that due diligence. And, uh, and then, you know, present it to, uh, to the regulators, you know, whenever it comes time for us to ask for a rate increase. So that's the way we do it. Uh, you know, public entities might be able to uh, do it a little bit differently, but in the, on the private side, you know, it is, it, it's an investor owned utility and we need to be able to, you know, you know, reasonable for our customers. Okay. And the next question, um, is the facility insured through the National Flood Insurance Program? And if so, did any of your upgrades help reduce the cost of insurance? So we are privately insured. We do not have, flood, uh, we, I don't, we do, we're not part of the National Flood Insurance. We have private insurance. Uh, and the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Uh, our insurance carriers were very happy to see all the investment that we made. And our rates actually did drop uh, based on their analysis of our design and, uh, you know, and, and execution of the, of the flood protection. So, you know, we are, we are insured uh, above, you know, we are self-insured to, to 5 million or $10 million. I forget what level it is, but uh, from that point on uh, it's, it's covered by insurance and uh, they were very happy with what we, with, with what we put together here. And it, that was reflected in our, uh, in our insurance rates uh, when, when, we, uh, when insurance renewal came around. Well, people are thinking there's a nice note in here for you, Oleg, from Julia Rockwell. She said, thanks so much for a great presentation. It's a powerful example of the importance of vesting, investing in climate resilience and flood protection. Well, thank you. It was my mm -hmm. pleasure. Question, um, and you may not have any answer, but... You know, it seems like you're working with a pretty large plant. Do you have advice for any of the smaller utilities as to how they might approach adapting to floods like these um, in the near future? It's a very difficult question to answer uh, because, you know, right now you're, you, you have to play the hand that you're dealt. Uh, so, you know, if, if, you were, if you were designing a new facility, obviously, You'd want, to, you'd want to design into it flood protection or better yet, design it out of the flood, uh, flood danger zones. Uh, we did that ourselves. Uh, as I said, the Canal Road Water Treatment Plant, which is the plant which is directly on the other side of the Raritan River from us, uh, is at a much higher elevation. And that, that was planned uh, in the late 1970s. We actually purchased the property in 1979, and we didn't uh, start constructing the new facility until the early 1990s. Uh, so there was always a plan that, you know, anything that we did, any expansion that we we're gonna be doing, we we're gonna make sure that we do it out of the floodplain. Now that presented, you know, its own set of challenges because, you know, now instead of being close to, 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 to the river and, you know, not having to pump uh, a lot of water you know, uphill, uh, now we have to design pumps that will discharge water at a higher head so that it gets to the top of the treatment process and then flows down, downhill from there. 
Uh, so if, if you're building a new plant, build it out of the flood zone or, or plan to have flood protection measure or flood protection uh, built directly into your facilities. Uh, I worked at a small facility uh, at, at the beginning of my career uh, in Short Hills, New Jersey, and it was uh, it was designed, you know, because it was sitting right on the uh, the bank of what's known as the Canoe Brook and the Passaic River. Uh, they they actually put in flood gates into the building itself, so the doorways and the windows were designed to have flood uh, protection installed in them. Uh, and, you know, and that can be retrofitted. Uh, I know of several facilities in Pennsylvania uh, that had some flood protection measures installed several years ago, but, you know, water finds a way and it found a way around their fl flood protection. Uh, and all I could say, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, you just, you just never know, you, you, you know, it, it's hard to imagine, you know, this amount of water coming down in such a short period of time, but it happens now. And so we, now if you don't think it can happen, you know, it will happen uh, and you need to plan that way. And so, uh, you know, you, you have to be as conservative as possible and, you know, you need to plan for flood mitig mitigation before it happens. So, you know, e each one of these big storms is is a lesson learned and it's a uh and it's a warning uh and you know if you you know if you in any way shape or form are at risk you need to take the time now in order to execute on some type of uh resiliency plan thank you very much oleg this was really interesting and you know obviously so timely um so um skelly did you have any um Closing thoughts or comments, or did you want to just mention some of the upcoming uh, WRA DRB uh, events? Oh, Martha, you're the best. Um, first and foremost, huge thanks to Oleg and to you, Martha. This was super compelling. And thank you to the folks who tuned in. We got fantastic questions. Uh, we have a couple events coming up in the next few weeks. Um, on May 4th, we have our Young Leaders event at Morgan's Pier. That's going to be hopefully nice weather. It's right on the water. Uh, and we have our technical event Monday, May 16th. We are back in person. We have a phenomenal keynote speaker. Um, I'm going to ask Mark Gold to give us a 20 second or 30 second on our keynote speaker. And then we will be posting information about the technical event as we finalize speakers. Hi, everybody. And nice to be with you all. And great job on the presentation. Um, so for our technical program, which we're having at the Pocono Environmental Education Center, everyone should take a day off and come up and attend just because of where it is. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but the keynote speaker is Maddie Stanislaus. Maddie is currently the executive director of the Environmental Collaboratory at Drexel uh, and also vice provost of Drexel. The collaboratory was set up and, and launched in February. And I would encourage you to check out their website. They're positioned to do some very interesting things, both in the region and internationally. And Maddie's background is both as a senior official at EPA in the Obama administration, and then working for international organizations, advancing climate change work and sustainability. And he's all about doing things where there will be action. Um, and I think he will give a very impressive presentation in the collaboratory. Again, if you were to look at it and see his background, I think you'll be very impressed. So that's on May 16th, right, Skelly? Correct. I tried to edit his bio. Every line was impressive. We are so excited to have him not just be our keynote, but he is willing to do a facilitated discussion with us. So that'll be part of the afternoon. Bring your hiking boots. There will be a chance to do some longer hikes, to do some stream sampling if you like, and explore the Pocono um, Environmental Education Center EcoZone. So it's gonna be a really fabulous event. Um, thank you to Oleg, this was so fantastic. Uh, you know, we hear so much about climate change and about how really challenging we, things are with 
regards to flooding um, and temperature change. So it's super exciting and inspiring to see this kind of resilience planning. So uh, Oleg, thank you so much. I have a thirst for chocolate milk right now. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Thanks thank everyone. you. Thank 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 you